welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Does it seem that love comes and then goes away? Do you have the experience of being deeply in love with your partner one moment, and then the next moment feeling separate or distant or even just carried away in a cloud of emotion? Well, we're about to change all that. Today, we have part two of our conversation with Diana Richardson. In particular, we are going to focus on how to always get back to love in your relationship, a topic in all of her books and the focus of her book, Tantric Love, Feeling vs. Emotion. If you heard part one, which was the second episode of Relationship Alive, and it was focused completely on her approach to Tantra, then you know that she is one of the leading sex educators in the world. For more than 20 years, she's been teaching about slow sex, a kind of cool sex that will completely transform how you experience yourself and your partner as a sexual and sensual being. She has written more than six books on Tantra, is the producer of the award-winning Slow Sex Movie, and people travel from all around the world to take the Making Love seminars that she teaches with her partner Michael in Switzerland. So definitely check out her website, livinglove.com. So, be prepared to learn a new way to experience your emotions and a practical guide to always get back to love with your partner and within yourself. And we will also be offering a lucky listener a free copy of Diana's book, Feeling vs. Emotion. So stay tuned for details on how to win that. Meanwhile, Diana Richardson, thank you so much for coming back to be a guest on Relationship Alive. Well, thank you, Neil, for inviting me back. It's my pleasure. I I think a good place to start, actually, uh, I'd like to pick up some of the threads from our last interview. So for those of you who haven't heard part one, please check it out. But you will be able to to understand what we're talking about if you're if you're joining us new here. So you, you don't have to you don't have to stop listening and go back. <laughs> um, it, but it's there for you. So we were just before this interview, we were talking about the how this material is born out of your own journey, your own experience, and how this wasn't just some technique that you learned and are now imparting to people. I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners just a little bit about that and and how important that's been for you and the people that you're working with in terms of really getting this material and having it feel like it's a, a live body of work that's that's being created as you as you teach it. Yes, you know, in in many ways, I can just say my life is my work. Um, and that is not anything I ever expected that I would write books and teach people because how I started was just from point zero, you know, like where we are is where we are as far as um, being conventionally conditioned is in sex. And um, what was significant for me, I feel, is I went in with absolutely no goal, no intention, no nothing. I just went in through curiosity and started to apply a very, very simple uh, keys or um, just little inputs while I was making love. And I was doing that in conjunction with the man and we were talking about it and trying things out. And um, and what really, really struck me was that it was, um, I felt so different as a person. And that was amazing. Like just a few little elements in sex that I change and how that good that makes me feel. And so it was really keeping an eye on that that kept me um, kind of exploring. So in that sense, you know, I I did have sources, uh, tantric sources. One was uh, my master Osho um, from India and another man is from Barry Long, is Barry Long from Australia. Both are now uh, passed on. But they both had from different perspectives very, very crucial keys or inputs um, that I started to try out. And from that, a completely new picture of sex emerged and um, revelations, understandings, insights, a little bit like more and more getting a bird's eye view of sex and with that more and more understanding and kind of grasp of (laughs) what is actually happening in the sexual domain in our society. So 
it was never anything I ever wanted or, or strived for. Uh, after some years of experience, I decided to write a book to see if I could put it down in writing, my experiences and so on. People started to talk to me. It was easy for me to talk about. So kind of it, really what I'm trying to say is one thing led to another. And when I arrived in Europe in 1993, the field was pretty full of Tantra, and I thought I didn't really have a place here. Um, but pretty soon I became aware that this real essential work around awareness and, and, and uh, transforming sex into love, nobody was really covering that. And actually, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just doing what I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and then slowly, it's uh, just really, you know, starting with two, three, four couples. You know, today, it's just this flowering tree where there's loads of people always ready to be in the workshops. Um, so for me, that really reflects uh, that this body of material speaks to people because the body of material really is saying that, you know, our body is designed for th certain things and to connect in a certain way, but we're overriding it. You know, but if we step down and start to listen more to the body, understand the body, understand the difference between male and female, uh, you know, so this is... This is what is um this is resonating with people that they can sink into their naturalness and their you know less ego around sex less um tension around sex. Do you remember a moment for you where you were like whoa this is different or or you know just kind of a key like oh I'm onto something here or I feel like this is a totally new journey for me. Yes, yes, hundreds of moments, <laughs> hundreds of moments, really, and um, I think that's. But the thing, the thing is, it was like I was in total isolation. There was the guy I could talk with, uh -huh. but nobody else. And in fact, it's so interesting because I've never been able to ask anyone a question. You know, in all this uh, close to thirty years now, since I first started, um, and at the same time. I notice how people always are asking questions in the groups. Now, look, I'm happy to answer questions and I understand, but it's um, like we don't allow ourselves to discover. We want to know the answer before. <laughs> and so my whole thing is unfolded like no questions. I had no questions. Well, there was nobody. There was nobody to ask. But also, I didn't have any questions. It was more like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? And then integrating and, like I said, realizations and like palm, you know, mm. and certainly in making love itself, like uh, incredible moments. That uh, and then it started to make me feel a bit isolated. I mean, not in a, not in a bad sense, but it's perhaps also today why I'm relatively unsociable is that there is so much misunderstanding around sex, and then you're just sitting in the middle of it. Mm. <laughs> Be, the things people say, how they say, what they say. and um, So you're just like, where do I even start in this conversation? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I've never really talked to people about what I do. I kept it very private. I was not, you know, like all over the show with it. Rather, people came to me and said, look, I can feel you feel very different. What's going on? Or, you know, so it was more people observing from the outside because I was living in a community at the time. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, that's why it was, um, you know, people knew we, we, you know, we were in a big field. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I'm sure that all our listeners right now are like, well, this is going to be a very interesting interview with no questions. Like, uh, what's next? What's <laughs> <laughs> no, not reflecting, but just, just saying that, you know, if one really, trusts the body and goes in with a like inquiring adventurous spirit all the answers come to you uh, uh, the confirmations and so on uh, it was more just to say that this is you know what I am presenting and sharing with people is completely just organically something that's developed within me there was no ambition there was no goal um, so that, that also gives me confidence in teaching people and in working with people because I'm not trying to present something. It's just, hey, look, you know, this is what I found out and um, maybe it's helpful for you. Right. And the whole point is 
for someone to tune in to their own experience and be present with what is happening for them. Yes, yes. And that's interesting because in terms of how we have sex conventionally, there's there's so much focus on the the building of pleasure and excitement and the release into orgasm that often people aren't really paying attention to anything else that's actually happening within them. Yes, that's right. And it's almost like when they're on that layer, it's not possible to perceive the subtler layer. Mm. You know, and that is the difficulty. So in other words, you're engaging your whole sexual energy and your body awareness to very superficial level pleasurable but superficial and um, so really this thing of beginning being able to perceive what's happening really in the body more on the cellular magnetic level uh, this requires a dropping into oneself you know which you're not doing when you're busy building up uh, excitement and, and wanting to go for orgasm so I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive but it's more that we, um, when we enter sex, we just go for it, you know. Whereas there's a lot we can do before we decide to have an orgasm. Right. You know, it can be hours down the road. Right. Yeah. So that brings me to a question, and, and actually maybe I'll just take a quick moment because I know the point isn't for people to hear my voice. They want to hear your voice, but just to... Oh, but I like to hear your voice. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, to quickly summarize what we did talk about before, um, just to put our conversation in context, we're talking about a different way of having sex that we've, co uh, Diana has coined as cool sex instead of hot sex or slow sex. And the idea is to not be goal focused, to not be orgasm focused, and instead to be really present. In fact, one of the first things that you said, Diana, in our last interview was that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. It's the the awareness that you bring right. to what you do. That's S right. So all of this is an approach to connecting both with your partner and with yourself that allows you to tune in to these more subtle levels of energetic connection with your partner, what's happening within you energetically, and and we also talked about some of the ways that that can be a vehicle for your own healing and yes. that it's not when we when people talk about sex as a vehicle for healing it's not like you have enough orgasms and voila you're healed it's like there's something else that's possible there that is connected to how our bodies experience life on a cellular level and when you transform how you have sex, you will start to be able to clear your body of stress and toxic emotions that it's been holding on to or pain that it's been holding on to. And then that's when your intimacy and sex can really be a vehicle for, for growth and expansion and, and connecting with your partner in a way that leaves you feeling connected versus um, have the traditional approach where people have orgasms and then often experience huge roller coasters of emotion and lack of connection, um, which is ironic, right? But, it, but isn't it true that that's what most people report experiencing after they've had sex? Well, yes, but we don't recognize it. You know, mm. that's the thing. We, we just think this is how humans behave, but we don't associate it with our sexual behavior. And this um, building up tension and discharging tension, which is effectively what we're doing in the sensation style of sex. You know, when energy moves down, it, the, you know, it's, it's a release of tension. And there's always a byproduct of tension that remains in the system. It's inevitable. Mm. And then this tension, you know, finds other ways to move. And it also has been done, you know, research and so on that this short moment of uh, ejaculation, uh, especially stronger with men, but also with women, this short moment of like a forced peak orgasm, this um, 
you know, it really affects the brain and the brain chemistry that uh, puts us more into isolation and separation. It's a bit like a blast of coke, you know. So um, there are consequences to our sexual behavior that we never even realize are connected with sex. And so this is why after, you know, like hot sex and so on, a couple will often have a fight. And, or, you know, there'll be some discontent or some feeling of separation because that's also one of the things that happens. You know, you you lose your energy. You have to kind of fall back on yourself. There's this lack of, of um, bond between the people. Um, so, yes, there are consequences. And that does lead, the way we have sex leads to a high level of emotionality in our society. And so that's really a good way then to move on to our theme for the day. Yes. You know, that is about this whole subject of emotions. And for our listeners, just so you know, um, Diana has a book called Tantric Love, Feeling Versus Emotion, Golden Rules to Make Love Easy. And this was co-written with her partner, Michael. And maybe a good place to start, Diana, is just you, you, the book is titled Feeling Versus Emotion. What's, what's the difference? Well, there is um, a very, very big difference between feelings and emotions. And at the same time, it's also an area. Well, it's uh, two words that we use interchangeably. We think feelings and emotions are uh, the same thing. But actually, when you really start to look at the two states, they are completely different things. So it is important to understand that the essential difference between an emotion and a feeling is that feeling relates to what is happening now and emotion relates to what, something that has happened in the past. In other words, when we've had a feeling in the present that we've had to, that we have suppressed or had to suppress, um, then that stays in the system and gets, uh, changes its form and becomes an emotion. So our emotions are unexpressed feelings. And we do live in a society where we are not encouraged to express feelings or only certain feelings, you know. Right. And, uh, so everybody is on a, you know, feeling level carrying a lot of, lot of unexpressed feelings. Now, um, the important reason to know the difference between emotion and feeling is because um, so often fights are the source of tremendous unhappiness in a couple. And often the source is not to do with the present, it's to do with something that happened in the past, even with a previous partner or even in the family or something like this. So when this past element comes in, it really breaks up the love. You know, it really destroys the love when we have these ups and downs. Everybody thinks a relationship that love is up and down, but love is not upside, up and down. Love is something, an essential integral quality, you know, of the being of, of us. We are born in love. And so in that sense, we can say, you know, love is a state of being. So that state is always there. Now, whether we are aware it's there or not is another another thing but when in a couple who um is together in love or in a love relationship um so often you know the past comes in and that they suddenly in separation and they think it's to do with their personal connection but it's really to do you know with with the past so um it's more, if you understand how emotions come in and disturb the love, uh, then you can say it's actually the level of emotions that is rising and falling. And when the level of emotions is high, then we can't feel the love. And when the level of emotions is low, then the love is there. And if we look at our lives, you know, it's like this with, in the partnerships. You know, we have these fights, can't feel the love. After some days, we get it all together again. Love is there. And this carries on and on. Um, so what now, you're saying is that love was always there? 
Yes, but we don't understand how our emotions interfere with our love because we're not really aware of this whole um, package we are carrying from the past mm. and the unexpressed feelings and the tensions that is, that is creating in the system. We're not aware how it's impacting our love in the present. And the problem with unexpressed feelings is actually they go sour in the system. And so when we move into emotion, which happens in a split second, you know, everything is really rosy and somebody says a wrong word or, or, or does a wrong thing, very small and boom, you f go into this immediate disconnection from a person. And that is the first symptom usually of when emotion is present. Um, so when we come into the state, there's quite a few symptoms, we can talk more about them, but what is so significant is that we get very toxic. Now, anybody who's ever been emotional recognizes that they are pure poison in that moment. Then what we do, we start to put that poison around our environment, you know, which is the person closest to us, you know, our family and so on. So we start then to toxify the environment around us rather than realizing what's happening, take responsibility, take the toxins away, deal with them in the past, uh, deal with them separately. So that is why it's so essential to uh, A, learn to identify when you're emotional, B, to sort them out separately, and C, when feelings are present, to allow them, you know, not to push them down. Um, of course, there's a few things, quite a bit to say about that, but uh, because the more, every time we push down a feeling, you know, it comes back at us at some later point. Mm. Um, even if you're in great love and, and, and you want to tell somebody how much you love them, and then in that moment you'll think, oh, no, I can't show my dependence or wh whatever, you know, talk yourself out of it. Um, or show my how love I am, you know, a few minutes you will feel like, a few minutes later, possibly depressed. Um, so it's important to recognize emotions and also to allow feelings. And uh, obviously the first place to, to address is this uh, emotions and to realize that, um, that this is an aspect of the past that has been triggered in the present by a word, a deed, a, a resonance in the voice, something that unlocks the key to that old memory and that unexpressed feeling. Um, then that means we're in a position to, position to protect our love and not always again and again, you know, pour the toxins of unexpressed feelings into that. Like so many couples, and you know, 23 something years I've been working with couples have come to me after my partner, my partner and I have done the teaching of the day when we do feeling and emotions. Um, you know, and just like, oops, you know, with my last partner, we had one fight too many. And we all know the truth of that too. You know, love is resilient. Love does bounce back. And we know it for ourselves. You know, awful situations are boring. There's love again. But there does reach a point sometimes where love just does not bounce back. You know, because for love to really flourish, we need an environment of awareness, you know, sensitivity, clarity, insight. Now, again and again, we put toxins in the environment you know, so we do, it is an area where, A, we are quite, we're not informed about it. So it's a little bit, we can say, a blind spot. And, um, yeah, so once we start to get an insight into that, it makes us more responsible for our love and preserving our love. And, you know, it's not to say that emotion is wrong. There's many reasons why we are emotional. People have had very difficult situations in their lives, in relation to sex, in relation to, you know, so many different things. Um, so emotion is not wrong. It's not knowing that one is emotional. That is wrong. Because when we're emotional, we really, we lose it, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, we, we lose contact with reality. Um, and we're very convinced in that moment of emotional that we are right. And this is one of the other symptoms. I am right and you are wrong. And you go very in your mind, you know. Uh, so it's very mind-oriented. You, you argue and discuss. You blame each other. That's the main symptom. You know, so also you can't look uh, the person in the eyes. You'll always be looking down. So these kind of indicators or symptoms, it's really good to have an eye on. The minute you say to your partner, you always, you never, you know, this is all means that you are in this moment accessing some old um, tension that is not to do with now. Um, then, you know, then you can start to realize how much the past is impacting and destroying the present. And then, you know, in the books, in the book, there are these steps, you know, that we suggest that you take when you notice that you're emotional. So the first thing is to notice. Second is to say, I am emotional now. You know, not time out, not I need my space, but really to say I am emotional. It's not easy because it's a very high, you know, it's an ego state. It's not a love state. Mm. Um, so the ego is like utterly convinced, very self-righteous. And... Um, and so I think couples are so used to when you like, let's say uh, some big emotions come up for you and they were triggered by your partner, then if you're not thinking, oh, this is about something unresolved from my past, then what you're probably thinking is this is all related to what just happened. And now it's up to us together to resolve this messy emotional place that I'm in. Yes, that's right. That's right. So the act of saying, I'm emotional now, it, and kind of leaving it at that, it's like, it's not, I'm emotional, and now it's up to us to fix this. It's, it's fully taking responsibility for being the one who's in that state. Yes, absolutely. And then the next step is to depart from their company. In a polite way, I'm emotional now, I need to do something, and really to leave their company. Um, say, and also say, I'm coming back. So not, you know, to walk out the room and, you know, I'm, I'm going and slam the door and swear. Uh, <laughs> just really to say, I'm going, because that's what we see. That's what right. we see on the movies. That's how people behave. Right. And, um, yeah, so, to, you know, I, I'm going now, I need to do something for myself. I'm coming back. And then you really go and you do something physical. It's very basic. It's simple. You just move your body in a way that feels, that gets you moving with intention, you know, jog, shake your feet, bang a pillow, whatever is possible. Scream if you can. Um, but but really burn it up um, in the physical body. Because actually when these toxins from unexpressed feelings, when these toxins are released into the system, they actually move through a sheath of tissue called the connective tissue. Now, this is a, is, um, in fact, connect, connective tissue is right through us and it binds us from, from the deepest layers to the most superficial layer, layers. It spirals through the body four and a half, five times. And, um, so they move through this connective tissue, and you can feel it if you're alert. When you suddenly get a hit of emotion, how it's suddenly like this toxic substance enters the body. So that's why it's so important to do something with the body. Of course, there are different ways you can meditate. You can, you know, bring it up to the heart and bring it back to a feeling. But really, the direct way, especially initially when you start playing with this um, way of 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 seeing and and moving forward with these things is just to, you know, go and do something really physical. And, and you will feel how after some hours, you know, that wall or that feeling, or you feel better and then, you, you know, you go back. And if you still feel that you can't really, you know, the wall is down, but there's still some tension, you part company again. And the reason to part company is that um, because of this tendency to argue and discuss, to blame for self-righteousness, um, to stop that continuing. Now, one of the sadnesses, I mean, not the sadness, it's reality, is that when one person gets emotional, the other one does too, instantly, because we all have uh, this um, 
stored unexpressed feelings. Hmm. So in an instant, you know, we all know that. Boing, and then you're a light as well. Or let's say you're switched off as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so then if two people get simultaneously emotional, then they have to part company and both go and do something individually. It sounds very simplistic, um, but really, really, it works. And um, it's also quite a, it's a direct thing you can do. It's, 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 yeah. So it's highly recommended. And, you know, parallel to the shift in sexual orientation that, you know, we present in the books and the workshops and so on, this, this material about emotions and feelings stands really, you know, head and shoulders with that other material because it's linked also. Right, because and, as soon as you are becoming more aware of what's happening within you, then you're opening a channel to start releasing some of that stored emotion in your body. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, firstly, because people doubt their love, because, okay, they can still you know, start to work with the sex, something's happening, but they still argue and fight. And suddenly when you've got the emotions picture, it's like, oh, there's like a relief. People stop doubting their capacities. So in that sense, it gives people a way forward to to deal with that element of the unconsciousness that exists, you know, with us humans. Um, and as well for the reason that you just said that through relax, through relaxing, through being through uh, more conscious and sex, this is a healing, um, and old things start to come up. So we want them to come up because they're sitting in the system. The system is not free. The system is not clear. Uh, but we need to understand that if we suddenly go into separation, then um, this is not to do with the partner. You know, so. Th- uh, so first to welcome it, be responsible. Also, sometimes when a pain comes up, um, just like some old sadness, some some old feelings, to allow them through instead of repressing them, to understand that that's an old memory, attention, a vibration moving the system. So, so how would on- you know whether, like, if something comes up for you? How do you know if this, if it's a feeling like, oh, this is something because we you mentioned earlier that you should allow your feelings. So this is a feeling where you should share with your partner. Wow. Right now I feel blank versus, oh, this is an emotion. It's time for me to say I'm emotional and get some space before we reconnect. Yeah. Very often, you know, with feelings, it's not about saying something, but allowing something, you know, it can be tears can be shivering and shaking, uh, it can be a scream, it can be laughter, um, you know, so it's these kind of like movements of feelings in the body, which, you know, usually you, you can sense them around the solar plexus wanting to move through, but we repress them. And so if you really catch a feeling at its source and you'll feel, you know, as I said, you'll feel it in the body, not in the mind. You know, it takes seven, eight seconds. It moves up, it's through because you've caught it at the source. So even anger, if you catch anger at the source, it's a beautiful energy. You know, one golden rule, and we have two golden rules. One golden rule is you never put your anger on 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 your partner. So if you feel this roar of anger coming through, uh, and you just turn away, you know, and just let it through because when it's pure, it's not poisonous. Mm. And... um, so there's nothing wrong with anger per se. It's anger in certain situations can protect you, you know, can right. even save your life. And I've had certain, you know, certain situations where suddenly, you know, the only defense I had was just to like roar, mm. you know, at this man and kind of like blast him away. Um, so it's good to have access to, to anger, but not in the distorted sense, you know, where it's repressed and, you know, because anger is so... Uh, destructive so um so that's what i'm talking about more these kind of feelings not you know it can you can express this what i feel about a situation or what i feel about you but more to get these things that are rising you know bubbling in the moment that often we we suppress 
So Is as that clear? that's very clear, and it for me brings up the question: Let's say that you are the partner, and so in other words, like I'm I'm with my partner, and my partner is getting emotional. Um, what do I do? And um, what do I do if they're emotional? That's question one, I guess. And then, how do I? As a partner, allow them to have an experience of their feelings without jeopardizing that process. Well, you've really brought us very nicely to the first golden rule. I mentioned there was two, and this one is: you never tell your partner that they are emotional. <laughs> you know, because that is so provocative. And the second thing: it's easy to recognize somebody else's emotions than right. your own. Right. So, um, if you if a person if one person does not go into emotion, um, actually there is potential for healing in that, in the sense of that the person who is emotional, if they don't get that two to tango response, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That then the whole energy is inverted and they can perhaps um, get some kind of insight or... Uh, memory or where the first injury happened you know say for instance abandonment is the most common uh, everybody subjectively felt abandoned at one point in their childhood mm -hmm. a common it seems to be the human reality mm -hmm. so that's why abandonment will come up again and again you change your partner still this abandonment 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 so easily so it's one of the oldest wounds and very easily triggered so like i had a situation once um actually with my partner, and um, I very early on detected that he was heading for some emotions just through a tiny little tone in the voice, a little um, complaining. Uh, so when it came, I was prepared for it. Now, actually, funny enough, at the time I was writing The Heart of Tantric Sex um, uh, the chapter on feelings and emotions <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he went into this whole abandonment thing that I'm always with the computer pa 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 um, you know very valid things because I was not available but I didn't engage um, I just kind of stayed there and somehow in that moment he got so thrown back into himself that he accessed he, suddenly this picture came of the first memory of being abandoned and being this little boy and thinking his parents were never going to come back and just like sitting in the window and just looking down on the street. Um, and then he moved into the real feelings that he had at that time. Mm. That he had not, you know, the, the real feelings when he was a kid, what was going on in this um, state, you know, situation he was in. And so that was, so you can access sometimes within an emotional state, you can access feelings, but they will be with their root feelings. Um, so in that way, a partner can be of support, but you can never try and do that, you know. It's just after you, you have to just be present. Um, one thing that is interesting to realize is that you know, I talked about a whole bunch of emotions, uh, symptoms for emotions. Mm -hmm. um, now, if if we look at really what is the overlying state we are in when we are in emotion, you will see that it's fear. We're in a state of fear. Mm -hmm. And really fear, the opposite of fear is love. So... Um, or actually, that's the wrong thing to say. When so, when we in that in that state, what are we longing for most? We're in this fear state. What are we longing for? We are longing for love. Mm. And if you look at yourself in the emotion, that is it. It's the most difficult thing for you to receive. You'll fight against love, but it's inside you are longing for love. So, the Im partner who's not emotional realizes that this person is longing for love in their deepest being, they can make some uh, effort or attempt um, to address that. There's no recipe. 
but somehow to come across with love, whether it's physically, verbally, whatever. It can very easily happen that then an emotional person will pop, you know, just reject your love out of hand. You have to watch that you don't get emotional then, like, well, I'm coming here, <laughs> you know. It's so fast. Yeah, one that reminds me of the the Osho quote that you have, one of the quotes, because you have many in the book, but about um, fear being like darkness. That's right. And that you don't you don't get rid of darkness, like you can't work with darkness. It's yes. like, so the only way you can deal with darkness is by turning on light and shedding light that's on the right. situation. So right. bringing love to a situation that's enveloped in fear is the way to get rid of that darkness. Yes, because really he, he also says fear and love are opposites. You know, we think love and hate are opposites, but love is like hate standing on his head. In a way, I see when he says love standing on its head, I feel like we're emotional. Mm. But the real opposite of, of uh, love is fear. You know, in fear we expand, in, in love we contract, in love we, you know, in fear we doubt, in love we trust, in fear we feel lonely, you know, in love we feel connected. Um, so that's why so often people try and address fear when really they should be addressing love as mm. as a healing root, you know, because fear does not exist, but uh, it's like the you know non-existential desert and getting more and more into the dark, whereas, you know, love is the light and we can do something about love now. <laughs> you know, we don't have to postpone and just to become more generous, you know, with one's love, more love you give, more love you have. Um, so love is not something accidental, uh, comes and goes. It's really something that we can cultivate. And part of that cultivation of love is this recognition of emotions and feelings and not allowing emotion to destroy love. And um, another part of that, um, you know, like cultivating love is how, how you have sex. Because when we have sex or when we make love, with awareness, which is the basis of what I am conveying and my understanding of Tantra, which differs from other people. When you make love with awareness, love is created. So one can say that Tantra is the transformation of sex into love through the awareness. So this is where it comes back, you know, to your starting point. It's not what we do, but how we do, mm. you know, how you, you bridge the interview today. Yes. Um, so it's when we, the how is with awareness, you know, not more and not less. And we don't understand, we don't realize the transforming and healing power of awareness. And um, that it has the power really to displace these old tensions, these old memories, sexual traumas, everything um, from the system and free an individual, you know, from very difficult sexual pasts. You know, so many people abused in our society. You know, so many girls, unbelievable percentage. And a relatively high percentage of young boys. So we are wounded, you know, in sex. And of course, then these wounds, especially in the sexual domain, make it very difficult for a person in their life, especially so many unexpressed feelings. So, yeah, you know, to... To make a real shift in the fabric of humanity, the way I see it is somewhere it's got to start with the roots again. You know, sex, who we are, what we are, what's our potential, you know, where, you know. So, yeah. So you've offered um, some really practical guidance on how to deal with an emotional state. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you listeners, like when you try this with your partner, how, it, how does it shift things for you? Um, I also want to mention that I, on our last episode, Diana offered a free signed copy of one of her books, which is Tantric Sex for Men, which was the first book of hers that I read and was hugely transformative for me. Uh, I have my personal copy of Tantric Love, Feeling Versus Emotion. So it's not signed, but I would love to give this to a lucky listener. So if you're hearing this episode within the first week of its airing, 
Uh, you can download the show guide for this episode by going to neilsatin.com slash tantra, T-A-N-T-R-A. Or you can text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444. And... Um, and if you do that within the first week of this episode airing, that will qualify you for the giveaway. The, the, the guides will be there forever. So th those are always there for you. Um, so I wanted to offer that to a listener. And um, also just a reminder, all, all of the links for Diana Richardson, for her books and her website, her seminars, her DVD on slow sex, those will all be available on my website, but you can also visit her site, which is livinglove.com. And if you don't remember that, just go to my site and there'll be a link to livinglove.com. So Diana, I'm wondering if you have any practical suggestions on what someone can do to simply cultivate that feeling of love or tapping into that sense of love as a state of being that's always there once you get rid of the emotions that are getting in the way? Um, yes, it's, um, you know, really to, to start to move through life with more awareness in everything you do, every moment in your body. And that's where the body is such an important bridge for us to the present you know, so in your own body, start to be more aware, soften tensions, you know, relax the pelvic floor, breathe, um, start to bring more self-love, you know, uh, mm -hmm. appreciating yourself, starting to feel more deeply into the tissues. Uh, because we're a bit fixed on sensation with the body, we don't have much real cellular sensitivity. Just start, So start to take the awareness more into your own body and... Be more aware how you walk, how you sit, how you move around, how you stand. And always look for the optimum, you know, grace. And um, Yeah, I loved, in, I think in your book you mention the get, cultivating this sense of the miracle of your body, like all the way down to the, I mean, certainly it's down to like the atomic and subatomic level, but even on the cellular level, like there are all of these components that are working together for you to breathe, for you to experience life. For yes, you yes, yes. And so it's really to move out of that mechanical thing with the body. Of course, you know, we do many things again and again, but it's just start to feel what you're doing, be with what you're doing, uh, moving from thinking to feeling. Uh, you know, from mind to body, from doing to being, just somehow inverting one's attention more. Um, and that really, you know, has an impact on you and how you are with people. And be more conscious in your communications, you know. Also start to feel the toxicity of emotions. And that's something I didn't say about emotions that I will say is because of this toxicity, we like to get revenge, Mm. So we do so many things, say so many things that we really can regret for a lifetime. So that's why it's so important to recognize this area and to be individually, you know, responsible. So, yes, cultivating love. You know, the body is with us every moment. So in that sense, we have so much access um, uh, to an improved reality <laughs> mm. if we just take the awareness in. But our conditioning, everything is out. Um, how we stand, how we move, everything. So we have a very superficial or, no, our, our awareness is much more on the circumference than in the core, if you know what I mean. Right, right. So the more that you can bring your awareness into the center, into that core, the more you're going to connect with that feeling. Yes, yes. Or that, that state of being is perhaps a, a better way of saying it. Yes. And in terms of sex, because you just a moment ago, you brought it back to the way that we have sex. And we, we talked about this a lot more in our last conversation, episode uh, part one of our conversation. I'm wondering if we can offer our listeners just one more quick glimpse into what what is sex like? So if someone's just listening to this interview, they're probably like, well, well, what are they even talking about? So I'm not having orgasms and I'm having sex with awareness 
and um what am, what am I doing exactly or how do I how do I know when it's over like if there's no if there's no orgasm like how do I know when to stop um <laughs> or um you know and and obviously I just want to let everyone know that Diana's books about that are they actually do get into a lot of the nitty-gritty of ways in which to connect sexually with your partner that are all about answering these questions. So we're not going to cover it in the last minute of this interview. Um, can you convey just a little bit of what that experience is like for for you and how it, yeah. Well, I think we know what, what I'd rather convey is to people how, you know, to start. Great. And, um, you know, it's not like you don't have orgasms. It's really not about rules or any kind of like ideas. It's more you start to be more aware in sex. That's what you start to do. You do what you've always done, but with with more and more um, kind of awareness, you you realize that, you know, if you build up the sensation, the intensity too much, you're going to come. So you stay a little bit cooler, um, you know, uh, you prolong the whole thing. If you want to come, you do it some, you know, some hours later. So it's not this thing of just going for the goal. It's how to be more present, more here, let the thing unfold. In time, you know, it could be after X number of years, you go, oh, really this orgasm thing, I'm not so interested in anymore. You know, and you, you kind of let it go. Um, or it lets you go because you just realize that to be in the present and feel this more subtle vibrational kind of sex is so much more fulfilling, makes you so much happier. Uh, that you don't, you know, bother to go there. You can go there anytime you want. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not ever possible again. Or So, you know, and slowly, slowly tra sex transforms into, yeah, just a more loving act, a more conscious act, a more connected act. Um, and through that, through that so much more harmony, you know, is created in the relationship because the way we have sex conventionally, you know, we do enjoy it mostly. Uh, but there are many things women have lost interest, blah, 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 women don't come, men come too quickly. Um, but when we start to understand really, you know, more about the basics of sex, how the body is designed magnetically, how we are different, how we can use these com the complementary nature of man and woman to elevate the sex uh, experience to something much more fine. So it's just the most fascinating inquiry. You know, like, I don't know, if you're going to do something with your life, check out sex. <laughs> because, <laughs> And then, you know, the thing is, as you, you know, have little homeopathic experiences, insights, understandings, things come and fall more and more into place. So it's a fascinating kind of like unwinding. Um, main thing is, is like, was in my journey was not to have a big goal. I want this. Let's just say, let's, what, let's see what this brings. You know, and whatever it brings is what it brings. It's not, it didn't bring me this. So that's so important in this more like, um, you know, exploratory or explorative and uh, inquiry style. Um yeah, it's and so this and this definitely, definitely makes for more love. So that is through sex, one can definitely cultivate love in a big way. To me, it's really telling too when you consider that what we were talking about earlier, the disconnect that people feel often after having an orgasm and and also that feeling of, oh, man, like, it's over. I mean, I guess maybe in, sometimes people feel a sense of relief, like, phew, it's over. But but if you're – I think that the part of sex that people probably do enjoy most is what is – what comes before. And so what we're really talking about is a way of really sinking in to that what comes before orgasm and exploring that fully and – being in awareness when you're in that moment. And it makes sense to me that at that point, 
why why orgasm or the goal might just kind of fall away because what you were really enjoying anyway was how you were cultivating love with your partner. Yes. Prior to. You know, it, 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 just to say that it is really confusing, this thing of like, you know, how do I do it? And it, often with the w workshops, you know, especially we have times for practice and the first time is always like a trip for people because – you know, there's like, how do we do something more consciously that, you know, so it is a bit for the mind, a bit of a, a, a twist. But really, once you start, you know, you can drink, you, you can start with simple things, you know, picking up your cup of coffee more consciously or eating more consciously. You know, you need to start pulling that in generally uh, to your life. Right. And then it follows into all the other parts of your life as well. That's it. <laughs> Well, Diana Richardson, thank you so much for coming back on Relationship Alive to talk more about Tantra and in particularly today to talk about feeling versus emotion and, and how to really keep going back to, to love in terms of your connection to your partner and your connection to yourself. And I, you know, I know that this is going to be really valuable. So I look forward to hearing from our, our listeners about their experience with this. Again, oh, great. if you want more information about Diana, visit livinglove.com. And um, Diana, I'm just wondering before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to mention that you've been working on that, um, that our listeners might be interested in? Uh, yes, Neil, that's great. Thank you. Um, you know, recently... I did a series of interviews called the Living Love Audio Series um, for a platform called Skybright. Uh, it's like a online library and these um, that you subscribe to. And so I do have some interviews and hopefully some uh, audio books coming up on there. Also, hopefully in iTunes too. So, yeah, thank you so much, Neil. It's been more than a pleasure and uh, to talk to you and feel your interest your experience your insights thank you you're most welcome thank you diana and thank you for listening to another episode of relationship alive if you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on itunes if you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.